Um, thank you so much for uh, joining us in the world's hardest to find room. Um, it's great to have more people in the audience than on the panel because that's always the thing that you're most afraid of um, with, a, with a panel session. And the title of our panel today is Management Lessons for Small and Medium-Sized Agencies from a Fast-Growing Billion-Dollar Business. Um, the content has changed slightly since I actually submitted this talk because we've got a new member has joined our management team in Elise um, and she also has a lot of large agency experience so we wanted to kind of give as much content as possible today. Um, if it's okay with you guys, I have not been looking at the, um, the online questions. We'll do questions from the floor if that's okay, if nobody minds, and I'm happy to repeat them so that we can make sure that everybody hears them, if that's okay. Thanks. And so I'm Tamsin Fox Davis. Uh, I'm the head of growth for System Seed, and I'm facilitating today so that these guys don't start fighting because that would be deeply embarrassing, um, which they won't, they probably won't. Just for notice, um, you'll see that Anthony and I have the same surname. We are not married. We are brother and sister. I like to make that very, very clear from the start. I'm, I'm going to ask uh, everyone on the panel just to introduce themselves really quickly, maybe explain just a little bit about your background, so which angle you're coming to this conversation from. Well, hi everybody, good afternoon. It's great to see so many here. Uh, my name is Julie Shuard. I am the COO or Chief Operating Officer at System Seed. Uh, and I am here because I, well, my background, I have about 14 years of experience in digital consultancies and transformation and have uh, been working actually for more, most of my career actually at a large consultancy called ThoughtWorks um, and bringing my experience and my lessons learned from different roles in operations, consulting, uh, you name it, to uh, System Seed where we are solving lots of problems on a day-to-day -day basis. So yeah, excited to share. Um, my name is Anthony Fox Davis. I'm CEO at System Seeds. Um, I've been in the company 12 years in Drupal the same amount of time and I acquired the company um, after six years in the company. So that was six years ago and now it's our baby. Hi, I'm Elise. Nice to meet you all. Um, I'm the CPO at System Seed. Um, I come from a background of 17 years of UX, product strategy, product management, uh, worked at ThoughtWorks as well, heading up UX for Spain for them for a while, where I met Julie and Stola for System Seed, and also worked internally for the WHO and UNICEF for a while, and then have brought all of those different NGO UN experiences into System Seed as well. Thank you. So, if you haven't met System Seed before, we are a very much a small agency. We're, you know, 15 to 20 people, depending on the size of the projects that we have at any one time and which of our kind of regular resources we've pulled in for specific jobs. Um, we focus specifically on social impact uh, work. So that's all of our all of our projects and most of our clients are, are in the, the social impact space. And we cover everything from hosting through development right the way through to UX, which obviously means a lot of juggling as well with, with different team members for an organization of our size. So I'm going to jump into the first question. Um, Anthony, if we can start with you on this one. What do you see as the main difference between an agency and a consultancy? Because a lot of the bigger organizations, they class themselves more as consultancies. You're going to see me relate to my notes so that I don't freestyle and go off on one, right? So um, we see that a lot of contracts and agreements um, are based on deliverables. And so that would be outputs rather than outcomes. I think that's a really clear definition. A lot of agencies might have um, very particular skills and they may want to um, look at those skills and look at the, the contracts and how they can apply themselves to the contracts. And it starts to be a spec list. And a lot of agencies are used to getting those sort of um, proposals out in the wild and, and trying to answer to those. But unless you're looking at outcomes, unless you've got problem solving at the heart of what you do, and um, you, you, you're probably more likely an agency than, than doing consulting work. And, if anyone's looking for the academic definition, the, um, it's, it's basically that consultants think and agencies often do, and we think the sweet spot is to have both. So if you're an agency that can perform consulting, you can have the power to think and the responsibility to do that in the job. 
So, so just to go on from that in terms of how to have impact, how to have outcomes with your client, my clients, my experience having worked very much in, in consultancy world and agency world and comparing the two is, is very much around taking the clients on that journey. You know, you can't have great impact if your clients are, not, are just going, hey, just do this. That we've already decided do this thing. You really want to take your clients on that journey with you. So really, you know, I know we've done a good job when years down the line in projects we're not involved with them, with them, which might not even be digital projects. They're still using the strategic advice and some of the methodologies that we do with them in other areas. So really taking them on that journey of they want to have outcomes, they don't just want to be thinking like in terms of features is a really important one. And we've seen that across the board. I mean, with we work with George Washington, sorry to name drop, but I will. Um, we work with George Washington University who were partnering with WHO and they were so overwhelmed with all the different projects they were working on and so impressed with agile methodology, which they'd obviously never heard of within a non-digital environment, they asked for us to come in and train them on how to adapt the way we were working into non-digital projects as well. So, so really having that journey, I think, makes a massive difference. And I think that the other aspect that that leads on to is we're very much not a feature factory. You know, we know there are certain clients who are always wanting to go, here is our list of requirements, tell us exactly how much it's going to cost and go away and do it quietly and tell us when it's done. And although that can be a difficult conversation at the beginning, we do have to say that that really isn't the way we work. If we worked in that way, we can't guarantee to give you the impact. And the impact's vital, especially in the social impact space. So for us, it's really about explaining why we, we are not just a feature factory and how we're going to take them on a journey of deciding, iteratively, we hope, on what features and what requirements are going to give them the impact that they need. Just before um, we ask for Julie's opinion, I, I wanted to check... Is there anyone in the room that would say, like, based on those definitions, that they, they are a consultant and, and working at a consultancy rather than an agency at the moment? No? Okay, one, like one person. So, oh, yeah, two. Okay, yeah. So, and, and everybody else is an agency? Like, purely? Okay, so one person, two people have put their hands up. The rest of you work in client side? Or, or, so or are you agencies that perform consulting as well? Yeah, you're an, right. you're an agency that does the thinking inside the agency. Great, yeah, that's, that's, that's good to know because then a lot of this should be resonating. And, and we're, not, we're not trying to be offensive to agencies, by the way, who aren't doing the thinking. We're not going, you don't think. We know you all think, just to, just to be clear. <laughs> yeah, I think that's really important. I, I think that's interesting too in terms of some of the, I guess, kind of added value and like you said, at least around the impact that you can deliver in terms of doing both the thinking and doing. Um, I saw that a lot when actually, you know, my previous experience, which was in a, a much larger consulting company. And I think this is one of the differences I see between consulting and agencies is generally actually the size of the organization. And there are pros and cons to that, of course, which I know we'll get into later. So forgive me for sharing one of my opinions now. I think in larger organizations, I've seen a lot that there's a lot of process and sometimes rigidity in the way that things need to be done, even at a practice level when you talk about delivery and the way that you're going to go about you know, solving a problem for a client. And that can sometimes slow down the process of actually making sure that you're doing the right thing and you're actually helping your client solve the problem at the end of the day. Whereas in an agency, especially one like ours at System Seed, I've been really impressed with the ability that we have to be very flexible and also very agile, for want of a better word, uh, to be able to adapt ourselves to really solve the problems of our clients and you know, work with them to figure out the right way of helping them achieve their goals. So. Yeah, I, th I think the takeaway, if anyone's looking for a soundbite, you might hear what sounds like waffle, but if, uh, if there's a soundbite to take away, it's that consultants think, agencies build, and the trick is to try and do both. With, um, with that sort of size distinction as well, um, I'd be interested to know, but particularly for Julie and Elise, you both worked at large consultancies before, and do you think that smaller SME type agencies can have the same level of impact with the client as, as the larger agencies? Um, Julie, do you want to take that one first? 
Uh, absolutely. I, I really don't think that the size of the organization has anything to do with the impact that you can have with your clients, um, or at least not in my experience. So I'm willing to be proven wrong. Um, but I think a lot of it actually comes down to the engagement model that you choose to have with your client, right? How you how you treat them, how you engage with them, how you work with them, essentially. Um, and something that we've been trying to intentionally kind of bring a lot more over the last, at least the last year into System Seed is revisiting our account management and our client relationship kind of practices to make sure that we, we are actually kind of walking the talk when we say to our clients, we want to partner with you. We want to be in a partnership with them to help them solve their problems. Um, and I think you can be a consulting company of any size, an agency of any size, and that doesn't matter. It's just about the way you choose to engage. Um, and yeah, Elise, maybe I'll ask for you to <laughs> stop there. If something comes to mind, you can always interrupt me. So, so yeah, obviously I'm biased, but I think often more than a larger consultancy or agency. Um, I think I, my personal experience in, in large consultancies, I saw that there would often be a real battle, often with the biz dev salespeople, where if they knew they could get something big through the door, but it was absolutely feature factory-like, we it would be a battle, but at the end of the day, often on the product side, we wouldn't win. And we would be told, you know, this is how we're going to do it. Maybe you're not even going to have a UX, or you're not even going to have a product manager. Just do as they ask, because we're going to earn lots of money on this. In my personal experience, um, I can't talk for all SMEs, but certainly for us, that absolutely never happens. I think we're all really aligned on the strategy that we want to go forward with, the impact that we want to have. So, so that aspect has just never been an issue and there's never been that frustration that I've personally had in larger consultancies. Where there's definitely an issue in terms of more on the client side, it sounds silly, but many procurement departments really play it safe. So they are still looking at the mega vendors. Um, you know, that, that fearful thinking and the expression, I have to look at it just to, why I have to be reminded, because we all say it all the time. No one ever got fired for buying IBM, right? So that fearful thinking is very much there. And sometimes I feel when we're talking to procurement or, or some clients, they're already thinking in their mind, it's got to be this, these very, very big vendors that we've heard of. So, so that still, you know, can be a challenge, but I'm sure it's a challenge for all SMEs that we all try and solve. Yeah, Julie, did you want to add something else before Anthony jumps in? So I, I think that's also really interesting when I think about one of the big differences between consultancies and agencies from what I've seen is also the ability to have dedicated people on specific roles, like what you're talking about in the business development department in larger consultancies, who, whose job it is is to kind of get under the skin and in the minds of procurement and understand how those processes work. And in a small company or a small to mid-sized you know, agency, we're having to wear many hats and juggle it all and figure it all out at the same time. And I think that there are things that you can do to overcome that and to bridge that gap in terms of, you know, leveraging a lot of the relationships that you build, but also in, in being really on top of it with the tools that you use to remind yourself about particular activities and milestones and trying to, well, trying to build more of a human connection also with the people uh, where you get the opportunity. But. Yeah, um, I, I think, you know, the question was about impact um, in a SME versus a big consultancy. I think being small and nimble People talk about Agile a lot, but I don't know how many people feel that they are in an Agile organization doing Agile projects. I think a lot of the time that is in name only. Um, but if you are small and nimble and Agile, and truly Agile, you can be highly efficient. And so I think that's where one of the strengths of being an SME lies. And you don't have to be fearful of that big competition because they're often slow, bogged down by process. Um, there's a lot of fluff that actually has to be paid for in the larger organizations, marketing, PR offices, like ad infinitum. So I'd say if you want to be efficient, either stay small, or when you grow big, you want to take the Microsoft and BBC lead, which is you carve out a safe space, a small silo with, um, with pure authority within that silo to get things done on an agile basis. Thank you. And as, as an SME agency, what would you each say that the key is to competing with some of those bigger organizations? that we're talking about. Do you want to start since you've got the mic? Sure. Um, so this will sound a bit like uh, Dries' story time. But um, so there's a well-known story in central government in the UK. 
and arguably like the most bureaucratic place on earth, right? Whitehall. Um, and you've probably heard of gov.uk. Um, it is the gold standard of central government websites. And I think it replaced something north of 10,000 different websites. So it, it's an incredible feat. Um, well, gov.uk was built by uh, Government Digital Services. This is over 10 years ago. So you know, I think many people have heard this story or know this case study. And GDS was created by Martha Lane Fox, who was the ex-CEO of lastminute.com in the House, House of Lords. And GDS used ThoughtWorks uh, to help create GDS and there, therefore uh, government, uh, sorry, gov.uk after that. Um, GDS decided to upend the local only approach to having suppliers and vendors support central government. And what I mean by that is there used to be a two hour perimeter ring around London and if you weren't a supplier based in that ring, you could not work for central government at the time. And so part of um, GDS was to create G Cloud, which was to expand that perimeter ring to the whole borders of the UK and to effectively, um, uh, they, they wanted free market capitalism, right? They wanted a free market where they could source suppliers from all over the UK and instead of just sticking to those within two hours of London. Um, and what this has led to today is that SMEs are actually scored more highly for GDS contracts than large organizations. So if we're looking at how you can compete as an SME versus larger uh, consultancies or, or, or bigger firms, just in the procurement weighting, being an SME of below a certain size will give you a higher weighting. You've got a more likely outcome to winning that proposal, like for like, apples to apples, if you're small. And um, last year, we worked with a well-known UK digital agency, uh, someone from the Drupal community, um, that was too big to benefit from some of those uh, uh, weightings. And so they asked us to co-bid on things for UK GDS contracts where they could leverage the fact that we were small and they would get high weightings. So, you know, go out there and make your partnerships with the bigger organizations while you're small. You've got something they don't have to, your, uh, to their favor. Um, that's, uh, I, I would say that is a goal probably for anyone small in the room. Find a larger partner. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to add to that is thinking about the current economic climate that we've been in as well. I think that it's really important to understand over particularly the last year that it's no surprise that our clients and businesses are tightening their purses and they're getting more averse with the uncertainty in spending money. And I've seen this a lot actually from my previous experience and now is uh, it's really important to make sure that your portfolio is as diverse as it can be in terms of ensuring that you're not just sort of sectioning into clients where you're only getting like long-term agreements or longer-term contracts that are, you know, going to, they do provide you some security and they give you a really nice level of predictability that allows you to be able to plan further ahead and, and all of those things. But it, you know, it goes the same way if all of your clients are very small and they're, I don't know, three, you know, one to three month contracts where you're constantly having to spin the wheels of your lead generation and your sales engine to start new clients, build new relationships. And I think the key to being, you know, successful and competitive in this landscape is trying to find a way that you're balancing, you know, your eggs in different baskets, essentially. Um, and I think that I have seen organizations fail in this last year because they have significantly over-indexed on those longer-term, larger contracts as a way to find that security and that being the prize. And of course, in the last year, many clients are turning around saying, we can't, we can't guarantee that funding for next year. And, and those organizations walked away from those contracts and now wish they had them. Um, so yeah, I think there's something really important there about figuring out what is the diversity that you want in your portfolio and, and leveraging strengths like how your ability as a small organization or as an SME enables you to be more competitive in that landscape and the, the service and the flexibility that you can also offer to a client that some of the larger players won't because they're being too stubborn for want of a better word. Um, yeah, and I'd say, although, yeah, I agree with Julie, obviously, but the, <laughs> but, but I don't know, I do. Um, and, 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 <laughs> they clapped at the end. Um, the, a good portfolio does help you, and I'm sure a lot of you have this, because many uh, 
reputable organisations and uh, centres of education, etc., want Drupal. And certainly we have found that it builds trust that, you know, we have a long-term agreement and do many large projects with WHO and UNICEF and some large charities like Concern. It, it builds trust that they are our clients, but also it builds trust uh, the longevity we have with them. You know, they are our long-term clients, they come back to us, and it builds trust with other departments of those organisations. So, in general, uh, within those organisations, other departments see the impact we're having and come to us first. So that definitely is helpful when we know those people are going to trust us because they know the work we're doing. And what would you say that you've learned from past experience and the, the way that you're currently doing things, the way that we're currently doing things at System Seed, that you think are the, the particular things that help us to be successful for the size that we're, we're at? Like, if you had to, if you had to pick, what, what are those things? I don't know if my answer written down here in front of me that I, I will stick to uh, it exactly answers the question, but I'll, I'll state it anyway. Um, another benefit you have as an SME is fewer lines of communication. And I think everyone's seen uh, like very famous diagrams now of a triangle, three people and three lines of communication. Then it's an exponential increase in terms of those lines for each dot that you add after the triangle. Um, I think that's really important that everybody is in the loop in delivery teams and that those lines of communication are, are fewer. Um, that goes for back-end operations as well. Julie's very good at tying the team together and it's very simple to have um, fewer people involved in that fewer lines of communication, uh, everybody knows what's going on. Um, you also get deeper into your solutions. The smaller you are, I think everybody understands what's going on. So it's not just the lines of communication, but it's what happens through those lines of communication. And you can get, you're far less separated from the solutions. So at the beginning we talked about output versus outcomes, feature factories versus thinking and doing in a consultancy level. Um, and really what you want your staff to do if, if you're, let's say, a digital agency, which I know a lot of us are, um, is not just to build features, but it's to have all staff on the delivery of a project understand that sector better, whether that is education, um, health, charity, it, it, like whatever that vector is in society, you want everyone in the team upskilling so that they have knowledge. If you think about a tea of knowledge or a comb of knowledge, you, you don't just have a deep knowledge in the sense of the technical expertise, but you have sector knowledge. And that makes you far more appealing the next time you go to market. You have experts in the industry, as well as experts in the hard, hard technology. So I'm trying to think about what I've brought with the experience or what's changed maybe since I joined System Seed. And I think the biggest thing for me, which has been a challenge because we're not a very big team and it's something that we have to work out every day and I have to remind myself that I'm trying to do this for the, for the benefit of the team and of our clients is to try and increase our ability to focus. Um, I think, thank you for the compliment on helping bring people together, but I think that part of my responsibility or something that I've taken on as a bit of a personal mission is trying to make sure that I'm increasing the ability for everybody in the organization to understand who is doing what and, and, and basically how we like how we leverage ways that we get things done so you could use the word policies and practices and processes um, or they can be more informal habits that you have in your organization in terms of the the way that you go about solving a problem or the way that you communicate which are cultural norms that you also have so I think it's important to make sure that you're harnessing the strengths that you have within your culture and the way that you the way that you do solve problems the way that you get things done um, and Knowing within your team, right, you know, if you're looking at the strengths and the challenges that individuals within your team have and understanding how to how to leverage them in directions where they can use their strengths and others can support them in areas where they're, you know, where they're not able to, to maybe fill all of the gaps. And, and try to remove barriers. So just like you would as a project manager on a team is sort of figuring out how do you eliminate as much noise as possible to help your team be as effective as they can be. And as I said, it, I know it's a constant challenge. I've seen it work better or worse in larger organizations where you just have more people, but that can also mean more silos where people are not communicating and not being as open to, you know, understanding how to help each other in a team. So you don't want to lose that either. Um, talking much more from a delivery perspective, because that's really my bag, 
Um, obviously, again, I'm biased, but I've worked in a lot of different consultancies and agencies. And System Seed for me have been the fastest developers that I have worked with. And I'd put a lot of that down to their amazing product manager. No, I'll put a lot of that down, partly that, but to really good agile process. And I mean, you can go too far with process. I feel that we have a really good balance of process is incredibly important to us, but it's not just there for the sake of it. And we're constantly getting feedback as teams, refining what we do there to make sure that it's working very effectively for us. And that's vital, right? Because when you're working for NGOs, you can't go, oh, you know what? Like we spent three days on some really cool experimental designs or going off on a tangent that we've decided not to use because those budgets really matter. You, you really just can't go off and waste budget in ways where there's got to be deliverables. So the efficiency there is important. And I think on that within the Drupal community, something that's really important that we find is looking at the work that we've done and how we can use work within different projects, right? So if we've done some really cool, cool customizations of the way we've done a content admin or translation, and then we're working on another client with some similar issues or some similar user flows, we make sure to discuss what we've been doing before and how we can use our learnings, the development we've already done to do that even faster. So, so those are some of the ways that I think we're, we're pretty speedy. Sure. I think what you've just mentioned actually just sparked another idea that I think every organization struggles with knowledge management and how to retain that information about what has been done before and how you can reuse that information. And I think that's actually also coming back to one of the previous questions, a really big advantage competitively that small to medium sized organizations have is that it's much easier for us to share that knowledge and for us to be able to reuse that in a way that larger consultancies I've seen struggle. They've spent millions of dollars on trying to figure out how to create libraries and resources and wikis and all sorts of things to do that. And I think that's a big strength that you have at our size. Thanks. So I've got one quick follow-up question, which uh, Elise, I think you'd be a good person to answer this one. Um, we Obviously, we're at a Drupal-specific, a technology-specific conference. Do you think there's an advantage to specializing in one technology if you're smaller or is sort of being more tech agnostic better? What, like from, a, from that management point of view? Yeah, so some of my experiences from a larger consultancy that really uh, sold themselves and famed themselves on being tech agnostic. And all I saw from that was that developers chose what was most in vogue and interesting for them and very, very rarely the right technology for the client. And therefore it would become very expensive, long delivery processes, lots of very fun learnings for the developers, but not great for the client. So in terms of, I love the idea in theory, but I've really seen that be an issue. So as long as there's some ways of tying down, look, we can look at what technologies we're using, but make sure there are people in that decision that are making that de decision right for the client. I think that's vital. And then I'd say on the one tech side, certainly from a design side, it's much, it takes time, right, to start to see some of the issues within UX and design until you've been within that technology for a while. And I'm sure you're all pretty used to some of the horrors that there are within the Drupal admin system. But if you have good UX and designers that have worked within Drupal for a while, they really aren't a problem because you know how to refine them, you know what blockers there are for the users and you know how to do that quickly. So I think there's real advantages there of having that expertise. Thanks. I, I, we've got some, some time left. I'm wanting to take some questions from the floor. If anybody has um, some questions, if you want to direct them to a specific panel member, that's, that's great, or general questions as well. <laughs> Tracy was first. <laughs> Tracy, what's your question? Just to make it clear, I don't know how, how this was phrased exactly, but we're not the billion dollar business. So the lessons are from ThoughtWorks, the consultancy that sold for a billion dollars maybe four years ago. And uh, with the inside knowledge from that, we're trying to learn lessons from that for SMEs. We're on our way, but we're not there yet. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everybody's going to leave the room now. Yeah, <laughs> click, click, clickbait. Exactly. I thought you all here, so it worked. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you. So just in case anybody, uh, anybody didn't hear that question, it was like, what are the milestones on the way to achieving that scale? Do, if, do you want to start with that, if you've got the microphone, or do you, would you rather Julie start with I've it? I've got nothing else to say other than I had the same confusion. I was like, are we a billion dollar business already? I know it's been a good year, but it's a bit nice. <laughs> We're in the M's, not the B's. <laughs> I can maybe provide a little bit of context from my experience around some of the things that I saw happen in the last, I mean, it really was within the last kind of five years, as Anthony said, that the organization I was working at kind of got to that level of scale. Um, and a lot was driven by targets on client acquisition and revenue, essentially. Um, taking some bigger bets in terms of investments that were made. So investing in growth is actually, it's something we didn't get a chance to talk about, but we've been thinking about that and starting to implement that in how we're, we're operating actually to grow our business. And, and I think that's very important. You cannot grow without taking some investment and putting that back in your business in various ways, which Anthony I can see is, is dying to maybe share some, that are gonna leverage your ability to be able to kind of reach those objectives. So, you know, whether it's just revenue that you're driving for or it's a certain number of, I don't know, clients in your portfolio, um, there are many, many metrics you can choose and I don't think any of them are right or wrong, um, but understanding the bets you're going to take, the experiments you want to run and the investments that you need to make is critical in, in being able to also look at those things, you know, in a very agile way and say, are they working for us or are they not? And when would you stop something and not, you know, not continuing for the sake of it, just because you've taken that investment already. These are also really important. Um, so a quick story time again. Um, earlier this year in April, I spoke to Spencer Gallagher. He runs uh, Cactus in the UK. They understand all of the agency landscape in the UK, thousands of agencies they work with. Um, he's really got his finger on the pulse. I very much recommend his book, Agency Nomics, for anyone who wants to see the A to Z of how to run an agency from someone who's seen it all. Um, and I think, well, he, he mentioned to me there were basically three ways to grow your agency. And so I'll just parrot these off as if, you know, I can take credit. So he said, there's new logos, new names on your portfolio. There's land and expand, which is the phrase from consultancy. So you find a client and then you cross-sell, upsell, side-sell, resell. Or M&A, mergers and acquisitions. And those are the three ways. So, and it doesn't mean you have to choose one, but as long as you're looking at everything you do as a, a growth strategy, boiling down to one of those three, then you're measuring the right things and you're, and you're focusing in the right areas. From there, there's a lot of um, opportunity to do different things. Yeah. And, and I think just something that's quite important to add as well, with, with that, with those three ways of growth, you can start doing that quite small, because, um, I mean, we've, we've acquired, we've acquired Elise's um, design consultancy. Um, she used to run, she, we used to work a lot together, but she used to run her consultancy independently. And, and we, I think you can start those things quite early on. Next question. I have several, and, and they're not really related to each other, so we might need to continue over here. Um, okay. <laughs> Everyone's welcome to join. Oh, good I question. I like that question. So it's much more about what does the user... Oh, yeah, if you didn't hear the question. Well, you said oh, oh. it so beautifully. Can you... Do you mind saying it again? Sorry. So this is a little bit mean, but I was wondering why the chief product officer um, says five or six times, we're not here to deliver features, we're not a feature factory. And therefore, I'm curious what is your product at System Seed and, and, and how you're approaching it? So, good question. I don't think it's mean. I think it's a good question. So, for me, it's very much about um, not to be rude to the client, but if they're left to their own devices before we get involved, they do not know what features they should be developing. That is the, the long and short of it. So, it's really about us being involved from the stage where we can go, who are your users? 
what do they need? What are their pain points? What are their goals? Like genuinely, what are their goals? Not just guessing and making up these pretend personas. And what does your organization need to achieve in the short term, in the next six months, in the next year, starting from that basis? And we then decide what those features are with the client. So the features come, but they don't just tell us what they are. Exa exactly, exactly, yeah. So it's, that's exactly, for those that didn't hear at the back, the bridge to being a consultancy is exactly that. We're not going, hey, like, you've given us a list of requirements. It might bring you good outcomes. It might not. That's not our job to know. We'll just, we'll build it well. But is it the right thing to build? Not our problem. That is not what we do um, ever, yeah. And the thing about that as well is, so I, I look after a lot of our marketing it's really harder, it's a lot harder to, to promote that because it's not like, yes, you'll get A, B, C, D. And, and if we say with a lot of our government work or NGO work, they have um, tenders that they put out where they're scoring you against, do you do A, B, C, D? And we have to start from, we don't, we, if, if you, what's that, what's that saying about um, if you ask someone the direction and they say, well, if you're going there, I wouldn't start from here. It's a, it's a little bit like that. And it's, yeah, it's not easy. And in fact, your talk last year really helped with that. So thank you. If, <laughs> if, if you've heard the phrase build and run, you want to build and run, not build and run away. So you want to support the client and support them around their outcomes. Um, often pressure trickles down in a hierarchical organization. And if you're down the rung and they're not getting their solution, they're not getting their outcomes, you're going to end up feeling that same pressure. What you need to do is push back against that and say, okay, let's start talking about the solution. But the best time to have that is before you start the work. Okay. Thank you. Um, just, just in case there are other people with questions, did anyone else have a question that they wanted to jump in with before we go to Jam's second one? No? Are we liking Jam's question? Oh, yeah, at the back. Great. So the, the question is, um, we have a particular strategy of going after one particular vertical. What are the pros and cons of that approach? Um, I'm going to pass to Julie to explain this in more detail. Um, but effectively, you do, you do want industry expertise, uh, any, any sort of hard skill, Drupal being one of them. But if you can be in a market, so if you can be in education, if you can be in charity, if you can be in government, if you can be et cetera. Um, but diversity is actually a key within that. So it's great to focus on a certain number of markets until you grow and to have diversity uh, built into the strategic plan for growth. But I'll let uh, Julie elaborate. Can I, can I say something that's, yeah, sorry, got hijacked it. So, so mine is not on, a, on the kind of business growth side at all, but um, more from our own kind of happiness. And I think that a lot of us in Systems Seed feel that way, that working in something where we can have positive impact has been incredibly important for us. I mean, until six years ago, I fully worked in the private sector. And certainly on the UX level, the better you get at that, that is basically helping large companies make people get their credit card out to buy something they didn't want to buy. And the better you get at that, the darker it feels. So for me, it's, it's a lot about that I now just love getting up in the morning and doing my job. And I think a lot of us feel that way. And that helps us with recruitment as well, doesn't it? A, a, lot, of, a lot of the people that, that we end up um, or, or that come to us when we're, when we're advertising new roles, it's a, a big part of the thing is you get, to, you get to work on projects that make a difference around the world. And, and that's important to us and the people that work with us like that too. Yeah. And I, I'm trying to think specifically about pros and cons that I've seen. And I think I, I can honestly think more pros than cons. 
because similar to what Anthony was saying is I do think there's a lot of diversity within the vertical or the sector that we serve, right? Um, we actually spent the last six months re redefining our sales strategy for the next couple of years. And within that, we have various domains and, and various uh, regions where we can target loads of organizations. And there's countless opportunities out there with companies and, well, and foundations and, and agencies that need to spend money on solving their problems. So we haven't really seen it being a con in the sense of the opportunity that's out there. I would say one of the biggest challenges I've found since joining has actually been a lot of how we're able to uh, get access to those opportunities. So a lot of it is about network building, um, which is the same in any, it doesn't matter what vertical you're in, it's all about who you know, right? Not, well, I hope what, what you know too, but uh, that depends. And, and I think with a lot of charities and UN, like UN organizations or, um, or foundations, there's a lot of uh, RFP process or proposal pro tender process is what I'm looking for. And that can be time consuming. So that's been something that we've been trying to figure out how we navigate better and we're still working on it. So if anyone has figured that out, I would love to hear about it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes left, uh, so I'd, I'd like to wind up there. If anybody wants to continue the conversation. We've got time for one more. Okay, one, if, if anybody has a quick question. Mm, yeah. do, do, you want, do you want one more question? Or do you want to go and have beer? It's fine if you want to go have beer. Does silence mean beer? Yeah. <laughs> I think, think, sil beer, I think yeah. silence means beer. Um, so we, we will be uh, downstairs. We've got a booth in the uh, exhibition as well. So if you want to come and talk to us through the week, we would love to, we'd love to chat more one-on-one. -on -one. Um, if you could please make sure that you rate the talks that you're attending in the app, especially ours, because that would make us really happy. Um, and we also have our team um, are doing another talk tomorrow, another one on Thursday, and we're running a bunch of boffs as well. So if, if you'd like to attend any of those, you see someone wearing a System Seed t-shirt, come and say hi. Um, oh, and we're, we're building Lego on our stand as well. If you like Lego, come and see us in the exhibition hall. So thank you very much and uh, enjoy the beers. Thank you.